Hi Booktube and welcome to a new video. This is a recent read of five books. Norwegian author Vigdis Hjorth is Mother Dead, translated by Charlotte Barslund. Curtis White, Memories of My Father Watching TV. Jesse Ball, Census. Uh, Donovan's Brain by Kurt Sjodmak. And finally, it's non-fiction, Viv Albertine, close, 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 music, 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 boys, boys, boys. I'm going to start with the Hjorth. Um, and as I was reading this, I wasn't sure which way it was going to go, but by the end, it absolutely convinced me. Five stars. So, uh, Johanna is a 50-year-old Norwegian uh, mother of one. And she has lived in America with her husband, Mark, uh, and being a painter uh, until her husband dies. And she comes back to Norway um, for an exhibition, a retrospective of her, her art. And her mother and sister still live in Norway, but she has had no contact with them for a long time because the circumstances were when she was the old, she's the older sister and uh, she had married a man called Tully, who was a lawyer. She was attending university to train as a lawyer. And she just knew instinctively this wasn't her, didn't feel right. So she told her mum she was going to go to an evening class in art, a sort of life drawing, uh, which her mother wasn't very happy about because both her mother and father regard art as literally arty-farty, and that she was much better on the straight and narrow becoming a lawyer and a, a mother. And uh, she goes to this art class, uh, falls in love with the, the teacher called Mark, who's an American, uh, on a sort of year's uh, visit to Oslo teaching. And uh, she basically declares that she's going to uh, leave her marriage uh, leave university and go with Mark to America and become the artist that she's always felt she's going to be and her family are appalled they're appalled and embarrassed uh, that she's leaving the marriage you know that sort of throws shame on them that she's became, going to become an artist uh, it's just for them it's, it's terrible and they barely maintain any contact just these sorts of postcards and letters with, with completely uninflected by emotion just news um, but even they stop once she does these paintings called Mother and Daughter 1, Mother and Daughter 2, which the mother takes as sort of an attack on her and the father is even more appalled. So even those sort of cursory update letters stop. So she's had absolutely no contact. But now she's back in Norway and this is where it gets a bit I'm not sure about this because she basically sort of starts she tracks down where her mother lives and her phone number and keeps phoning her and, and the mother doesn't never picks up uh, presumably there's no answer phone because then she'd know it's her daughter um, so it's a complete wall of silence keeping her at arm's length so she decides she's going to it's basically she stalks her um, and the sister Ruth sort of throws up this sort of protective uh, barrier to keep her away from her mother. That, you know, your mother doesn't want to see you. She's still, uh, everything you do is hurts her, all this sort of thing. And now this is where it's a case of unreliable narrators because we don't know who's, who's actually telling the truth. Is Ruth just keeping her mother away for her own ends? Or is Johanna totally ignoring the feelings of others in order for her to, you know, get what she wants, which is to, basically get her mother to answer some questions. So it was, I was a bit unsure at that stage, but as it wears on, what you realise, it's a brilliant, brilliant study of family dynamics. So originally, it was a, even though Ruth was the younger daughter, uh, it was a triangle, it was a very claustrophobic triangle between the father, who's this really straight-laced, you know, what will the neighbours think guy, the mother who always gives in to him and follows his lead even though she may or may not have some need to express herself and her own identity. And Johanna, who, who you know, is determined to express her own identity. So this is a very taut triangle. Um, you know, brilliantly summed up in, in one incident described where uh, Johanna is so clever at school that she finishes an exam early and comes home early. 
uh, and surprises her mother, who's in the middle of cleaning this sort of family heirloom vase, surprises her mother by being home, and the mother drops the vase, and it's the family heirloom is from the father, it was through his line of the family, and uh, when the father comes home, they know there's going to be hell to pay, but the mother doesn't protect her daughter. She basically drops her daughter in it, so the daughter is the one who gets slaughtered, even though it was just an accident and they were both sort of had a responsibility in that accident. It wasn't down to the daughter. All she did was put her key in the door and open the door. And that's the point at which the, the uh, Johanna knows that her mother hasn't got her back and that uh, the mother, you know, in other moments she praises her drawing ability without ever pushing her towards art but will always come back to the no you've got to be a lawyer you've you know you've got to marry and have kids and all this sort of stuff and that's as i say it's just not who johanna is so she's getting she's inching closer and closer in a creepy way to the mother uh, and ruth is doing her best to sort of you know stop it so now we have a second triangle the father has long died but now we have this triangle of the mother ruth and johanna fighting uh, you know, to to establish, you know, the lines of power, the lines of relationship. I just think it's a fantastic study of a sort of family claustrophobia, of mothers and daughters particularly. And you know, what is, what are the answers that Johanna is after from her mother? Is it to basically reveal that she is, although she's been able to express herself, although she has sort of made a lo a lunch for freedom, is she still the same type of person as her mother? Um, you know, she feels a bit adrift. Mark has died, her son is an adult and lives in Denmark. Um, so she's very much isolated. And, you know, she's come back for this retrospective. She's supposed to produce new art for it, and she can't. She's sort of so blocked by, you know, being back in Norway and all this stuff from her childhood returning to her. So I just think it's a really clever, smart piece of writing. Five stars. And another book I was sort of slightly in two minds about. Memories of My Father Watching TV by Curtis White. So I think now I've read all of Curtis White's fiction. He's got a lot of non-fiction, which I haven't broached. But I think this is the last of his books currently uh, that is fiction. And it takes the premise of, uh, if it is Curtis White, you know, the protagonist in here, uh, as a boy growing up, how blocked his father was. How he just, his father used to come home from work, slump on the sofa and watch TV all night. And there again, there was this sort of choreography of Curtis, the young Curtis behind him, trying to get his attention by sort of dropping food into his mouth and catching it. And there was a sister who'd constantly walk in front of the TV and back, trying to get her father's attention. And then the third sister was off to one side. So there's this sort of set piece choreography every night of the father watching these programmes because he wasn't there. You know, he wasn't there for them. He was there sort of physically, but not, not in mind. He, um, so he's an absent father, a depressed father, you know, he was a war vet, uh, Second World War, not Vietnam. Um, and what this book is, is a series of uh, imagined episodes of the shows that he used to work, such as Bonanza, such as Maverick, such as Sea Hunt, such as Combat, um, in which uh, the father-son dynamic and sometimes other members of the family take a, you know, they, they, they become woven into the story, but these stories are sort of more and more fantastical. So, for example, the, the one for Maverick has a vibe of the Mahabharata in it, and it's sort of, the TV's got a sort of blue tint to it, so Maverick appears blue, and in that way he sort of half becomes Vishnu, seeking out uh, his sister... Uh, to sleep with and, and sort of form the cosmic energy. So it's quite fantastical in, in all of these. And I feel some of these work and some of these don't. So for that, Maverick, it worked. For Bonanza, for example, it didn't work. But I think, I think the two key ones, um, one is called Combat, which is not a show I, I ever saw. You know, I'm not familiar, but it's basically a Second World War yarn. And uh, there, the father is represented, or sees himself, as a bridge in France, a bridge over a river, that must be blown in order to stop the Nazis reinforcing with their tanks. And the father is full of guilt, knowing that his own destruction is the only way to save the Americans who are trapped the other side. So there's a lot of stuff about Oedipal guilt imagined here. 
which I always find unsatisfactory because the theory of uh, Freud's theory of the Oedipus complex is not one I find terribly engaging. But there are other elements to the story of combat here. One is that um, the Americans won the, the war against the Germans because of baseball, that they were particularly good at chucking grenades, and the Germans were, because Americans and soldiers had grown up in the tradition of, of playing baseball. So they had fantastic arms um, for throwing grenades, which I thought was, was fabulous. Um, and. The, the, the story called Sea Hunt, around Sea Hunt, is, again, Sea Hunt is not a programme I'm familiar with. It's obviously a, about deep sea diving. And there, um, the mother and Curtis are in some sort of uh, hospital as sort of guests, because the father is, is um, inside the hospital. And the mother won't tell the boy, you know, where the father is, um, other than say that he's gone on a deep sea dive i.e. he's depressed, he's in, in the throes of depression, long, long, deep down, and unreachable. And I wasn't sure whether that worked or not. It was a bit obvious. Um, and I, you know, that's kind of what I felt about the whole book, really, that some of the stuff is really good, even though it's quite fantastical. Some of it's quite obvious, a bit clunky. So I gave it four stars, um, but I am slightly in two minds about this book. And on to Jesse Ball, uh, Census. So I'd read one other Jesse Ball novel called A Cure for Suicide. I didn't really get on with it. And I'm afraid I've had exactly the same experience here. And so I can't see I'll be reading any more Jesse Ball books. It's not, you know, he's clearly a good writer, but I just... He's one of those writers I describe as um, a non-sequitur writer, in that he, he sort of writes sentences which sound deep and profound, but he leaves them hanging. So you have, they're sort of contextless, really, or they're certainly not resolved and developed so you know what they're referring to or what the idea behind them is. And I'm just going to give you an example of that. So um, this is the father explained to his son about a song in a foreign language. Nonetheless, I wanted to tell him about the meaning of the song, so I did. I said that there was much to know about it, and little. That's the first red flag. Someone, because that's not really explained. Someone translated the phrases as, I live contented because I can see the day when I want to get out of this island. But this is problematic for many reasons, most particularly that the translation was conceivably affected by knowledge of the woman's plight. It seems she had sung the song to an otter hunter, and that he in turn had sung it to a good friend of his many a time so that he too memorised it, held it in his heart, and it was that man who in turn decades later recited it for another man with the mother's name of Talawia, sorry, Tala, Talawia Schwit, who brought us the above translation. A voice singing the words can be heard on a wax cylinder from 1913, which, incidentally, is the year on record with the largest number of deaths from lightning. So that last bit since about the, the lightning, it, it just relates to nothing. You know, there's no mention of lightning in this song or, or, or they're not encountering lightning on their car journey when he's talking to the son about it. It's just, it's just thrown in there. Um, it is synchronous and random, as he sort of says, which incidentally, yeah, it is incidental. But then, you know, this sort of trail of transmission of all these sort of generations to some random decides to commit it to a wax cylinder. So what? What is that telling us? I don't know. Um, and that's very much his style. You could pick any page and you get stuff like that. What it's actually about is um, a man whose wife has died, has been given a, a terminal diagnosis, so he decides he's going to spend his last days with his son. They're going to be travelling the country literally from A to Z because he signed on as a census taker. And that, you know, the idea of a census taker is, is quite interesting in itself in that, you know, they have no protection because, you know, if someone rounds on them, there has, there's no legal recourse because they want the census takers to be absolutely neutral and have no personal input and no personal responsibility. It's purely a, um, a disembodied, almost distanced um, role. And the census itself is quite creepy because once you've, you've taken somebody's particulars, you mark, you tattoo them, you make the, the tattoo of the year of the census, which is, you know, quite invasive, quite creepy. So there is some interesting stuff going on here. 
but equally, he's not he's not taking a census of every single person in these towns. There's sort of fairly random um, those who will uh, you know sit down with him and those won't. So you get a series of some more interesting than others, sort of these sort of off kilter personal stories, only about a page long about these people he's taking the census of. And some of those, as I say, are effective and some aren't. But they don't knit together. They don't lead to a bigger picture of this, this community, uh, this, this nation. And in the, in the introduction, Ball says he had a, a brother who uh, was a Down, uh, Down syndrome sufferer who died young. And that this book is a tribute to him about the, the absence at, at the centre of it. And in a way, the son here is absent. I mean, sometimes when it's described what he's he's doing while his father's off talking to these people, and sometimes he sort of plays with the, the children of the people that he's... Other times he's asking questions in the car and stuff. But somehow he's not really developed. You don't get a sense of the son at all. It's all about the father. Um... So I just found this sort of really difficult to get to grips with. I couldn't see uh, the point at the heart of it. So uh, I give it uh, three stars. An Old Donovan's Brain by Kurt Siodmak, German author. Uh, uh, fled the Nazis to uh, Hollywood and was sort of quite well known in Hollywood as a director. Uh, I was recommending this by Anne Novella uh, because uh, my next book, hopefully next book if it gets a publisher, um, looks at the possibility of immortality through downloading one's brain. Uh, so you won't have a physical uh, existence, but you still will have a conscious existence. Um, this is similar, written in 1944, um, whereby uh, a millionaire that dies in a plane crash, his brain is removed and preserved by a man, a research scientist, uh, and increasingly, uh, in order to see, you know, can he communicate? Is the brain still living in any kind of meaningful sense that it can take in new new data? Because it can't take in sense, senses. It has no eyes, ears, and mouth. Um, can it still sort of make decisions? All, the, all this sort of stuff. And increasingly, of course, the brain uh, takes over the mind of the researcher. And uh, this evil millionaire um, wants to. One of the things he wants to do is free uh, a murderer who's about to come up for trial in an impossible case uh, for the murderer to win. Uh, but this millionaire, in a way, wants to flex his muscles and show how much power he has, that he can get the worst of the worst off uh, as innocent. Um, it's a bit of fun. In some ways, it shows the anxieties of, 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 the, of the middle 40s. It was in the middle of a war. It was a man who'd fled the Nazis. And here we're talking about sort of mind control. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's all I can say about it, really. It was it was a, quite a rollicking read while it, while it went along. Three stars. And finally, in a way, the, the, the most pleasant surprise of all the books I read this week, as I say, non-fiction. Viv Albertine was the lead guitarist of the all-female punk band The Slits from 1977 78. They only produced two albums. Uh, but they were very influential. They had a sort of punk reggae style. Um, and when I, you know, I'd heard a lot about this book. It won a lot of awards. Um, I just read a book earlier called 69 Exhibition Street, which is about one of the sort of big main figures on the London punk scene. Obviously, Viv Albertine was. She mixed uh, with the, the Sex Pistols and The Clash, and I say mixed in a euphemistic way. Um, so my initial thought on this book, because uh, it's helpfully divided into two parts, each with their own contents list. The first is the punk, you know, her growing up, becoming a punk and, and slits and all of that. And the second part is life after the slit. So I thought, I'm really only interested in the punk bit. I'll, I'll whiz through the second part. Not at all. It's, it's much better and bigger than that. So uh, the first part, in a way, is in, in possibly less engaging. Um, it's a good study of, again, the London punk scene, just as 69 Exhibition Street was. Uh, it's very good on her recording each and every single one of her influences that led her to becoming a musician. Very much the sense of a girl in sort of, you know, uh, suburban London, knows that, you know, she's got lots of things to say but doesn't know what they are, doesn't know the medium by which she's going to say them. She's good at art, uh, but ends up in music, obviously. And I think it's really good, as I say, on building a picture of all these influences that inspired her 
uh, some she accommodated directly, some she didn't. Um, and this sort of need to sort of, you know, throw off the shackles of suburbia, to be something bigger than you were probably destined for by your upbringing. Um, you know, she sort of reproduces pictures in here of, of concert tickets and membership cards and, and stuff. You know, stuff I could never do because I never kept any of that. So I couldn't write a memoir like this. So I find when people do that, you know, they've, they've had the foresight at age 14 to keep this membership card for Sun Ra. Uh, the Sun Ra fan club or whatever. I find that all that stuff really impressive because it's, it's something I just can't, couldn't do. Um, so, you know, you get all the stuff about the lead up to the making of their two albums, them touring, the difficulties they had both as punk and as women, and as women dressed as punk, so, you know, not sort of demure clothing, but sort of outrageous fishnet stockings and hair all over the place and her mix and mend approach to fashion you know it says close 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 she is very struck by fashion and i slightly glazed over at those bits but i, th I think if you're interested in, in you know how she put together her look and it kept changing you know that that's in there so that first half was 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 fine but really the second half which i thought was going to be disposable to me was was actually what gripped me about this book and really impressed me um so after the splits, uh, the slits split up, um, she went to film school. She got some, you know, good working jobs um, behind the camera. Um, but so she was still able to sort of be creative and express herself. But then came the dread need for her to become a mother. Um, and this sort of takes over her life. But unfortunately, it's it's twinned with uh, illness. Um, and difficulty of conceiving and all of that I think is is brilliantly portrayed um, but eventually she does manage to succeed to find a husband um, you know has to be fairly remarkable in himself in order to sort of match her uh, her sort of creativity um, but illness is is sort of rife and, and makes you know the husband bent you know he 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 is really a, a sort of a saint in supporting her through her illness, through their uh, infertility treatments where they have many many rounds of it, and he's there for her. So you know you, you think good on you, mate. Uh, they have their daughter, and then we get into the whole sort of motherhood thing, which is in a way how do you reconcile being a mother with still being able to create and um, you know make your art and eventually the marriage falls apart so he's stuck by her but because of her burgeoning need to, to, to move away from domesticity and back into creativity back into the art world you know can you can those two things be reconciled well it's incredibly diff difficult to be a you know a, a, a normal domestic parent um, with someone who's on tour or in a recording studio or you know out at exhibitions every night hobnobbing with the people you need to network with um and the marriage the marriage breaks down um so she's alone again um with her daughter and she needs to, you know that what's driven it to that is her need to be creative so she picks up a guitar again but now she's a 40 year old uh housewife and mother and you know where she was with the slits which is a sort of punky you know uh, sort of acerbic um satirical view on on the three minute pop song kind of thing now now she's singing about motherhood and you know how it matches up and how it doesn't match up to the dream which is as she says is not a very common uh take within the rock and roll world um and you know it's just it was just brilliant I felt um, really won me over to something I hadn't anticipated being into at all. Five stars. And as to what I'm currently reading, I'm reading two books, non-fiction, Sleepless by Marie Daria Sec, which does what it says on the tin, it's a study of insomnia, and Gina Apostol's new novel, La Tercera, about halfway through this. Um, and my only plan for September is once I get a block of time is to... Um, Read Mira uh, Carterescu's Solenoid. Um, so, there you have it. Uh, that's my roundup for, for recent reads. Till next time, thanks very much.